You don't know about real loss. Because that only occurs when you love something more than you love yourself. I doubt you've ever dared to love anybody that much. Okay, so it's been a while since I posted the first episode of this series, which I'm going to link in the description, or you can click there if you want to watch it. Um, but if you don't know, I'm a professional counsellor, and I'm going through the therapy scenes in the film Good Will Hunting and basically analysing them. I did all the disclaimers at the start of the last video, so just to keep it brief this time, therapy is a wide field with an array of different approaches. I'm not interested in defining Sean's approach specifically or drowning you in a bunch of confusing jargon. Sean also doesn't necessarily do things the way I would, but that doesn't mean either him or me are wrong. It means there's lots of different ways to approach things and if it works, it works. It is useful context to just recap where we're up to in the film at this point. So we've had the scene where they both meet each other for the first time, their first session, where Will winds Sean up enough to end up grabbing him by the throat. And that scene kind of ended with Sean forlornly looking at his painting and then a cut away to this very lonely, depressed, slightly Edward Hopper moment of him at home drinking far too much and brooding on what Will had said. And this scene is followed in direct contrast because Will then spent the same evening on a date with Skylar. You know, he runs off with fun, budding, young love while Sean grieves over his lack of love because his wife died of cancer, I think five years ago. But Anyway, the point is Will's gone away feeling on top of the world, all powerful, where Sean was left in the dirt following this encounter with Will. That's what we've seen by this point as an audience, that's how Will sees what's happened and it's what we're thinking coming into this next encounter again. So let's just get into analysing it then. Um, fittingly for someone who feels on top of the world, Will comes down the stairs and enters Sean's office confidently. The fact he's already got a cigarette in his mouth asserts his feelings of dominance because he knows from last time that Sean doesn't like him smoking in there, it's against the rules. So to come straight into the session already smoking, that that's a statement of power. And the other thing of course is Sean isn't actually ready to start yet. The camera turns and we see he's in the middle of reading. See. Timing is often a big thing in therapy that gets talked about a lot because it does genuinely help to be consistent with your timings. Ideally you have the arranged time for a person's session each week. You know, we meet every Thursday at 2 o'clock until 2.50. That's how it is, that's how it stays. That's ideal because the client can then rely on that. You know, if you're working with people who fear abandonment, for example, this set consistent time is useful because it's easier to trust. If you have to keep changing the dates every week and whatnot, even if there's a perfectly good reason you have to do it that way, it might give the client a feeling like, you know, well, does he not care about me as much? Am I just someone to squeeze in amongst all the other priorities he's putting first? You know, there's other reasons too, but the point is, consistent timings show that you are someone they can rely on. And for similar reasons, you might want to start and finish exactly on the dot. No starting at 158 and no ending at 255, because if this is someone who fears abandonment, they might then feel slighted or anxious if you let things overrun one week, then the next you end it right on the dot. If you stick to consistent timings, then it's something the client can trust and it's then also symbolic for being able to trust your counsellor overall. How rigidly a counsellor will stick to these timing rules however depends on person to person. What Will says here though as he enters is you again huh? Which if you consider the context of Will trying to get himself kicked out last week, trying to force Sean to give up on him, driving Sean to the point of violence and the night spent drinking alone, that sentence can kind of be translated to something like so, you survived the first session with me, did you? Well, good luck because I'm going to make things even harder for you this time. He surprised Sean's come back for more, considering every other counsellor couldn't stand to see Will a second time. And deep down that'll mean something good to Will, you know, the fact Sean cares enough to try again. But right now, Will has his defences up and he sees Sean like the enemy, which is why there's a taunt and a sting to that comment, you again, huh? Anyway, Sean doesn't tell him to wait outside the moment because Will's a bit early or anything like that. He doesn't even stop to mark where he's up to his book. Soon as Will enters, he puts all that instantly aside, but he gets to his feet, grabbing his coat and says, Come with me. And as we know, they go out to the park so Sean can talk to him there. I think there's a lot of counsellors who wouldn't do this sort of thing. I mean. I certainly wouldn't take a client out to the park to give him a kind of kind of like a moral lesson or a lecture but like I said that's not what this video is about what Sean does to some degree works not entirely and we'll get onto that in a bit but it does work mostly and you know that's kind of all that matters so let's discuss 
why Sean does it and why it works. First, it's because their last session ended with Sean grabbing Will by the throat. I mean, obviously this is a movie, but nonetheless, it's <laughs> that's probably about the worst thing that could happen in a session. In reality, you'd be struck off. If Sean wants to find a way to prepare and pick things up with Will again, he's kind of going to have to need to address that a bit. They're going to need to talk about what happened. So, does that mean Sean should apologise for grabbing Will by the throat? I mean... Yeah, maybe to some extent, but you don't want to overdo an apology like that here with a kid like Will who wants to be dominant and assert his power because he might take Sean's apology like a submission. What you want to do is talk about why that happened, what the whole thing was about, the whole grabbing the throat thing. I mean, it wasn't just Sean's fault. The whole reason he got angry is because Will was doing everything he could to make Sean angry. He kind of wanted Sean to grab him by the throat. I mean, remember that triumphant, smug smile on his face there? It's that that you need to talk about. You can't just sweep the whole thing under a rug. You need to talk about what happened and more importantly, why it happened. But why talk about it in the park rather than in the office? In some ways, it's not ideal to leave the office for similar reasons to those I said about the consistency with your timing. You know, you want the room physically to be the safe space that the client can rely on. Taking him away might kind of disrupt that. More so, the outside world isn't a contained space. But in other ways, it's ideal because it's neutral. You know, Sean's office is an extension of Sean. It's, it's his territory, not Will's. Hence why someone defensive like Will might have his back up there a bit. You know, might want to attack the room as he did last time criticising Sean's books, the room's layout, his painting, wandering around inspecting everything. But out here it's neutral, it's not Sean's territory, it's not Will's. Which means they're both more equal, which means there's less for Will to feel defensive about, and if you're planning on kind of giving him a lecture like Sean does, you want his defences lowered as much as possible. Anyway, I'm getting too bogged down into this one point, I can explain it more in the comments if you like. Um, so let, let's just let the scene run a bit. So what's this? A taste his choice moment between guys. This is really nice. You got a thing for swans? Is this like a fetish? It's something like maybe we need to devote some time to. So it begins just as you imagine it would. Will's defenses attacking Sean through mockery, mocking the idea of counselling itself and the need to counsel the counsellor over his fetish for swans. As ever, Will is good at being a cocky little shit with clever mockery. Sean ignores the lot of it though this time because he knows it's just bullshit defensiveness. He doesn't so much as look at Will, he just stares off out at the park and waits for Will to finish. And once he does finish, Sean speaks. And he starts by honestly pointing out that what Will did got to him. I thought about what you said to me the other day, about my painting. Huh. I stayed up half the night thinking about it. Something occurred to me. I fell into a deep, peaceful sleep. I haven't thought about you since. Which of course points to what we'd seen before of Sean drinking alone in his room while Will was out having a fun date. You know, but the twist here is actually Sean was fine in the end. He was upset and hurt by Will at first, just as Will imagined him to be, but then he moved past it. Not as Will imagined. Will thought Sean would stay hurt and crushed by what happened last week, so when Will walked into this session with the cigarette in his mouth, all confident like the victor, taunting, so you again, Will was actually wrong. He's okay, you know? What Will's seeing here is a level of emotional resilience in the person that he's never encountered before. Sean's okay, and why is he okay? What, what did he realise? You're just a kid. You don't have the faintest idea of what you're talking about. And at this point in the film, we know that's true. We know Will just says a load of bullshit in attempts to simply hurt Sean, because, you know, we just saw him trying it again a few seconds ago, running on some spiel about swan fetishes. It's nothing but a scared kid talking complete bollocks. And it's when you realise Will's saying that shit specifically to try and attack Sean, that he's desperately launching any attack he possibly can. It's when you realise that, that you kind of see how sad that is. Hence why Sean is completely able to ignore Will's bollocks this time. And I don't want to get too bogged down analysing every line from this scene here, because I think for the most, what Sean says is pretty straightforward. Through various examples such as... I ask you about war, you probably uh, throw Shakespeare at me, right? Once more into the breach, dear friends. But you've never been near one. Through such examples, Sean makes the point that Will may have read all these books and he may be able to say all these very clever things and come out of all sorts of clever insights, but it's all just shit he's picked up from books. You know, never anything he's gained from personal experience because he is just a kid with 
vulnerabilities like all kids. And so essentially he's pointing out to Will that he talks a complete load of meaningless bollocks as a distraction to keep away from talking about the real him. You know, he acts like a cocky clever sod to hide the hurt kid inside. And as Sean talks and kind of peels this cocky mask off Will, you see the camera slowly turn until Will's face comes into focus. We see the real him now, which fits with the point Sean's making because he says, I look at you, I don't see an intelligent, confident man. I see a cocky, scared, shitless kid. And then the music comes in at the exact moment here where Sean switches from criticising this mask of cleverness Will wears to then pointing out that Sean is interested in the real Will. I mean, just listen and notice it here. I don't give a shit about all that because you know what? I can't learn anything from you. I can't read in some fucking book. Unless you want to talk about you, who you are. And I'm fascinated. I'm in. But you don't want to do that, do you, sport? You're terrified of what you might say. See, he's not tearing this mask off to attack Will, but he's doing it because he wants to know about the vulnerable, real person beneath. That's what's important, that's what Sean wants to work with and help. So like I said, I think a lot of what Sean is saying is pretty straightforward and doesn't need my explanations, but I will point out two things from this speech. The first is the list of examples Sean gives, like the, if I asked about war, you'd probably throw Shakespeare at me stuff, and, and so on. Sean um, gives several different variations on this. He starts with art. If I asked you about art, you'd probably give me the skinny on every art book ever written. I bet you can't tell me what it smells like in the Sistine Chapel. And this first example is fairly neutral. You know, it doesn't reveal too much about Sean personally, beyond knowing he once visited Italy and went to the Sistine Chapel. But the second example, if I ask you about women, followed by... But you can't tell me what it feels like to wake up next to a woman and feel truly happy is a little more personal and now we know he loved his wife. And then the third example about war, he follows it up by saying, You've never held your best friend's head in your lap and watch him gasp his last breath looking to you for help. It's much more personal now. Sean is openly sharing his pain, opening up the very thing Will is most terrified of doing. He does it gradually and slowly more with each example. And the final example is Sean talking about love. To have that love for her be there forever, through anything through cancer. And that's a hugely emotional, painful thing to open up about. And in this case, it's kind of important Sean does, not just because it tells us as the audience about his character, but for Will, it's leading by example. If you're afraid to open up, Will, let me start. This is how you do it. This is who I am. And that, of course, takes away a lot of the threat that a strange, scary counselor can carry because opening up like that makes Sean human in Will's eyes. Because I said last time that counselling more than anything is about two human beings interacting sincerely with each other. It's much more about that than it is about any clever psychoanalysis stuff. Sean's set that out here, you know, he's saying, I'm a human being, Will, I'm a sincere human being, much more than I am a collection of psychoanalytical techniques. And equally, you're much more of a vulnerable human being than you are a collection of quotes from all these books you've read. This is who I am, now tell me who you are. And that's kind of where the scene finishes. Sean says, You move, Chief. Because Sean's made his move, he's opened up, it's Will's move to do it next. Can he dare to open up, despite being terrified of what he might say? In the therapy equivalent of a mic drop, Sean says that, gets up, and leaves. Anyway, we're now going to move on to their next session, which will be quite short because it's mostly a montage of time passing on a clock. The scene begins with Will already sitting down in a chair. The fact he's actually sitting down says something quite big in itself because he'd spent most of their first session wandering around the room, asserting his dominance, avoiding sitting down. This time he's sitting there and he's silent. He goes to take out a cigarette but Sean says, No smoking. And although reluctant, Will accepts this and puts them away. Now if you saw the last video, remember when I talked about the fact that Sean didn't force Will not to smoke? You know, back then he pointed out the rule to Will in a gentle, jokey way. You know, you'd be better off shoving that cigarette up your ass, it'd probably be healthier for you. And when Will ignored this rule, Sean didn't force it any further, he just accepted to let Will smoke for that session. 
Remember I said back then wasn't the right time to go enforcing rules and boundaries, because that was the first session and Will's about as defensive a person as they come. Trying to force rules back then would have only led to an argument much quicker because Will needed to express the fact that he doesn't have to follow the rules if he doesn't want to. He needed the space to show he can rebel if he wants to, so Sean let him have that space. You know, alright, you can rebel against the smoking rule here. Now is the time to enforce the rule, however, because they've had their talk. You know, they've put all Will's bullshit defences to one side, and because Will has already made the point in the first session that he can rebel if he wants to, he then doesn't need to rebel this time so much. Like, I'm sure you can remember times as a kid when your mum used to nag you to do some sort of chore, you know, where there'd be something she was nagging you to do, and really it wasn't something you were that bothered about doing, but because she nagged you so much, it just annoyed you, all the nagging, and suddenly you're well against the idea now. The point is it's not actually the chore you were against in that scenario, you just wanted to make the point that your mum isn't the boss of you, that you can exercise the right to rebel. So. Similarly, Will isn't hugely bothered about the no smoking rule itself, he doesn't mind not smoking, it's more about a symbol of power, and since he rebelled the first time and has already shown Sean he isn't the boss of him, it means he's much happier to accept the rule this time round. Basically what I'm saying is we all need to exercise the right to rebel at some times, and if we're given space to do so it will probably be quite a small rebellion and then we'll move on. If we're not, it will escalate into something much bigger. Anyway, that is basically as far as this session goes. The rest is a montage of time passing on the clock and thumbs being twiddled because Will refuses to speak and Sean refuses to start so they just sit in silence. You know, silence is another big thing in therapy that gets talked about all the time and I sort of touched on it in my video about the breakfast club if anybody saw that. I'll leave a link for that in the description as well. Why not? You know, if you try to hack through Alison's defences, she'll tell you to eat shit. Camp on the edge though wait for her and you'll get somewhere. And the point I was making in that clip is if it feels scary to open up, you give that person some time. You know like um, a cat or some wild animals, when you see them out in the open and you want it to come to you so you can stroke it or whatever, if you approach too close or call too much it can spook the animal and it will run away. Whereas if you kind of remain still and just wait long enough, the animal will slowly realise you're not a threat and will gradually edge nearer and nearer, testing the space until it dares to go close enough for you to stroke it. It's, it's that sort of same thing. Because I mean, Sean could have tried to start the ball rolling here, you know, broken the ice, asked the first few questions, all that stuff, because I mean, often that'll work in ordinary life. When you're having ordinary conversations with someone who's shy, if you blabber on and just talk, the other person will eventually slowly become less shy. But this isn't technically about shyness. It's about Will not wanting to open up about his feelings because it's scary to admit and face up to his vulnerabilities. So if Sean did try to get the ball rolling and ask lots of questions, Will would probably just answer them all with one word replies or just grunts, you know, try and speak as little as he possibly can let the conversation die out time and time again. And that's a dynamic that counsellors can get stuck in with the client if they're not careful. Asking lots of questions that the clients just give one word answers to, nothing ever getting anywhere meaningful. The more you try to force them, the more they tense up and close down. So you don't force them, in most circumstances, you just wait. Because this room, this counselling space, is supposed to be your client's space to express whatever they feel. And maybe that means expressing how much they don't want to talk, or expressing silence or whatever else. If they're being silent, that means something. So you give it space, you let it be expressed, you think about it. And Sean even sort of explains this to Jerry afterwards. I just sat there counting the seconds until the session was over. Pretty impressive, actually. Why would he do that? Prove to me he doesn't have to talk to me if he doesn't want to. Because to link it back to the park bench scene, there we saw Sean open up a lot himself before telling Will your move, Chief. So it's Will's move now, for his turn to open up, and if Sean speaks first, that's interrupting Will's turn. You have to wait, so he does. It almost takes two entire sessions, but eventually Will does dare to open up. But that's the scene we'll discuss next time. There is only one other thing I wanted to talk about in this video, which is returning back to way earlier when I said although taking Will out to the park bench and giving him that speech did work, it didn't work entirely. And the reason it didn't work entirely is because 
Although it helps to strip back a lot of Will's defensive bullshit, that kind of is also the reason he clams up completely for the next two sessions. As I pointed out, Sean explains to Jerry that Will isn't talking as a demonstration to prove that he doesn't have to talk if he doesn't want to. That's not just about being scared to open up, it's also about rebellion. Like with the smoking thing, it's Will wanted to exercise his right to rebel here. Sean's told me to open up. I'm going to tell him, no, I can stay perfectly silent if I want to. And it's a very long rebellion. Two sessions, that's almost two entire hours of complete silence. You know, five seconds of silence when you're in a conversation with someone can be awkward. T two hours worth. And one of the reasons it is such a big rebellion is because Will is, unsurprisingly, quite angry at Sean. You know, Sean did kind of lay into Will last scene. He called him a cocky, scared, shitless kid who doesn't have the faintest idea what he's talking about. Will won't like that, but he can't go spouting all the same sort of attacks in response he did in the first session again because Sean's now pointed out how those attacks are just a load of bollocks. So. Will uses a different form of attack this time, which is the silent treatment. He goes, fuck you, I'm gonna ruin your sessions by wasting your time. We're not gonna make any progress whatsoever. I'm just gonna sit here and bore the shit out of you. See how you like that. And so that's what he does. And he does it until A, his anger's subsided a little. B, he's bored himself to death. And C, he feels like he's made his point by now. You know, notice the moment he does pick to finally speak is the exact moment Sean nods off into sleep. You know, I was on this plane once. But we'll discuss that more in the next episode. That's as far as this video will go. I know there's not as much for me to analyse this time round. That's because it's it's more straightforward to see in the park bench one. You know, there's, there's less to draw from it. Um, which isn't a criticism. I think the park bench scene is arguably the best scene in the film, but it's a lot simpler than the other ones. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, let me know what you think. If there's anything I've missed, anything I didn't explain well enough and you want me to clarify in the comments, anything you think I've got wrong. Uh, <laughs> thanks for the support. Thanks for watching and hopefully see you next time.